Louisiana verse all y'all. Jared Roser here with Andrew Lopez, whose face on my screen makes me feel like I was supposed to intro this for NOLA.com, Tom's Picune, Jared Roser, and Andrew Lopez. Um, what's up, man? Not much, dude. You uh, you need barbershops to open. Like, I, yeah. yeah. You? Um, so, Skylar Mays and I were on a call last night, and as soon as he got his camera right, he said, you're going for a little bit of a different look these days, huh? <laughs> and I don't know if he meant the hair or the facial hair or, or what. All of it. All of it. Uh, um, I will tell you what, it's, it's, better, it's better than the Jared Roser I'm looking at right now on my wall. That's um, – <laughs> No explanation necessary. We're just going to let people realize that I'm on your wall. And hashtag, hashtag Fat Jared. Fat Jared. I've been trying to fight that guy's – resurgence off for years um but yeah so obviously we worked together for a few years a few years back at nola.com tom spicune um and, good job yeah it was uh <laughs> it was interesting times always uh starting out on a job crap. in your apartment complex yeah came up or we'll remember the complex crew for a few few years i think i am if i'm not the longest tenured member of this entire apartment complex that I'm close because uh, I don't know I think the there was that lady on my floor who was like the chair of the yeah Riverside condominiums I, I didn't even know we had like an association uh I think she might have you beat though because she, she's just I, I've seen her like she just looks like she's been there a while but you, you gotta be second <laughs> I yeah I, I think I'm top five certainly and she I met her, I think, last summer, and she remembered. She's like, wait a minute. You, there was a, a guy that was a sports reporter here before. <laughs> um, but you – so at that point, you headed down back to New Orleans, recovering Pels, and and now since everything that happened last summer uh, with NOLA.com, Tom Spickeen, you've been covering the Pels for ESPN, which is pretty cool. Everyone is constantly – expressing their excitement for that and asking me how that's going now that your worldwide leader lopes dude I, it still doesn't make sense to me at times like it's still um when i I'll, I'll go on like I'll, I'll go on with sean fox up in up in monroe um uh, and he'll he'll just say espn.com and i'll be like it's really espn.com for me like it really it's just it's just a wild thing that of, of how all that came together. And it's really, I think today might be the year anniversary of like when I first made contact uh. with ESPN's editor um, and, and first got the ball rolling. And I remember, I remember, I remember being in Chicago for the lottery and not knowing what was coming next uh, because obviously the paper had already, pick unit already announced the buyout. I didn't know what was going on with Advocate. And I remember just being in this weird limbo. I mean, I was in a New York Times quoted in an article like saying like, eh, I don't know, this business is weird. I don't know if I want to keep doing this. And I go to Chicago, run into Mark Spears, um, who asked me, he's like, hey man, what are you, you going to do? And I'm, I was like, I, I don't know, Mark. I, I really don't know. He's like, you want to come cover the A's in, in Oakland for the Athletic? And I was like, I mean, I'm, I'll do anything right now. Like I really don't uh, like, I don't really want to cover baseball. That's what I'm thinking in my head is like, I don't really want to cover baseball, but I'm like, no, nah, I'll do anything. And that weekend, the, the editor for ESPN's uh, NBA editor followed me on Twitter and instinctively I fired off. This was two years ago today. Uh, one year ago today, I fired off like this long DM cause I didn't have her email. I didn't look, think to look for email. I'm like, yo, I, I, I really want to help come back and work with you guys. I don't know if you need help with Zion now that he's going to be here. And she actually initially, uh, we talked about this before, wanted me for a different position um, was what I originally interviewed for. And then kind of, we, we kind of settled in on, on me staying here and, and covering the Pels. And it's, it's been one really weird year, man. <laughs> um, start back but it's actually yeah to today is is one year ago where all this espn stuff kind of started just like we planned this call to, yeah. to work totally uh, that's why we postponed this call two days <laughs> yeah 
So I don't know if your mindset is 100% where mine was, but I run into people all the time and they ask about you working for ESPN now and they try to tell me like, Oh, like you're next to go do whatever big thing. And at this point, I mean, obviously I'm still very involved in the, the sports side of things locally, but I took a completely different route and had been working with international students 40, 50 hours a week. The last few years is, is why I left NOLA.com initially was that job kind of fell my way in its own weird way. But I tell people I never grew up thinking about much of anything other than I want to work for the times Picayune and cover sports in new Orleans. <laughs> and, um, and I think for, yeah, I, I tell people for you, like is, is pretty similar. Like that was kind of what we grew up around and wanted to do. And so it was, it was weird the way it all worked out for us in different ways. And yeah. So, so this is how much I always wanted to be a, a newspaper writer for sure is uh, I, you you know this from when you were cleaning up during your quarantine cleaning. Uh, I found this old notebook, um, complete with the Andrew Lopez signature uh, from Classic. eight year old eight year old Andrew. Uh, you got you have it on the back there too if you want to get a better look at it. Um, literally, the first page of this notebook um, is the, is a, a write up of the fake nineteen ninety four finals between the Bulls and the Suns. Um, where Scottie Pippen scores 33 points and wins the game with a corner three uh, late in the game, apparently. Um, we have box scores in here from, from fake games that, I've, that I wrote up. Uh, like, this is what I wanted to do. Shout out Billy Owens in there for uh, being – Nice. Um, being on the Warriors in a, a 147, a 127 win over the Spurs. Um, Billy Owens, of course, was the EA MVP for that game. I, I picked my own MVP in Chris Weber. But it's, it was just something I, I always wanted to do was, was write for the newspaper. And I got the chance to write for the times Picayune when I was 19 years old. Uh, and it was kind of weird to kind of get your dream job at 19 years old, even though I was, I was just doing prep games, but it was still so cool to me to – to be in the times picayune by the way I, th I thought after my first article i was done i was never going to write for the paper again um i was i was covering a prep game in pearl river um i, I forgot who they were playing at this point but i remember going to having to drive to pearl river and the internet card that you had to use to slide into your computer to get wi-fi went out and i had to call in my story in trey isles uh, the prep editor at the time had to take the story by dictation. Uh, and I just knew, I was like, they're never going to hire me again. <laughs> and I was like, I'm done. It's over. I drove back from pro. I was so mad that whole drive back. Cause I was just like, I ruined it. And uh, luckily they, they're okay with a couple mistakes. So <laughs> uh, internet card B, uh, you know, I got it fixed the next week and they were able to, to let me stay. So it, it was it was weird to get that dream early on, and so when when everything went down last year, I mean you know just as well as I do this this business is weird man like it's a weird might be an understatement it's 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 just it's a crazy world uh in in what we do so i I didn't know if I wanted to keep going I was still kind of in that in that shock phase I was just as ready to be able to go back and you know teach again at the at the alma mater and um everything kind of worked out, dude. And it, it, it just, things just kind of work out. And I was, like I said, like I was saying before, I, I still don't believe it at times. Like I don't believe that I'm on ESPN. Like it's just weird to me. Yeah. You, you very well could have been back at Holy Cross, uh, you know, sideline view of that 20 to 14 Jesuit victory in the fall. I don't know how the basketball. You just looked that up. You looked that oh, up. Yeah. During this, when, I, when I saw you in the shirt, I looked it up. <laughs> um, they, Actually, that, that Holy Cross group that has some really – some good players right now, Jalen Johnson. Oh, uh, Jalen. I remember Jalen yeah. when Jalen was like four years old, dude. That's when I, I – I taught his older brother at Holy Cross. And, like, I remember little Jalen running around. So, like, I'm really hyped that, like, he's getting offers and stuff right now. It's just really cool uh, to me. He's a little bit bigger. He's still running all over the place, though, when he, when he gets the opportunity. It's, it's fun to watch – what he's what he's been up to these last couple of years at Holy Cross and ready for the senior season. But 
I mean, we talk about how crazy it was that you ended up where you ended up. And now you, in your, your first year at ESPN or covering the first, the first year of Zion, which was its own, I mean, ordeal yeah. waiting for him to, to get back active. And then right when the Pels seem like they've got everything clicking and rolling uh, the second half of the season, uh, COVID-19. And so here, here we are. What has that been like as, as a sports reporter in, in your first year in this big role and all of these things happening around the team and then uh, the, the, the curveball of all curveballs gets thrown in? I mean, I remember being on the floor in Sacramento yeah. Standing next to David Griffin and another NBA official, um, as well as another reporter. And we're all standing together talking about, I think at this point, we had already heard, we're trying to figure out what was happening with the Oklahoma City game, the Oklahoma City-Utah game being, uh, being called off. And because nobody knew that Rudy had it yet. Rudy Gobert had, had Corona tested positive. And we're going through scenarios. And as soon as somebody told me, Hey, I think I heard that Rudy has it. A notification came across my phone and I was like, man, so we're just standing there and I run into some of the people and they were like, well, we're done for two weeks. Like, and which is, it's so crazy when you go back and think like, but for a story that I'm doing right now, I have to go back and look at the timeline of, of what Corona was doing um, in Louisiana. And when the, when the governor first said, hey, no more school in public schools, it was no more school for like three or four weeks. And the NBA was like, all right, well, we're done for 14 days at minimum. And then it's we're done for 30 days. And you thought like, okay, we'll be back in a month. And that didn't happen. And it was just – it was, it was crazy because, as you talked about, for the Pels, it, it may be it, – it's the difference between making a playoff push and not making a playoff push. It's, it's a, a playoff push and a lottery pick because what they did was they were getting healthy at that point. Zion was hitting a stride. Zoe was hitting a stride. And they had the easiest schedule left in the NBA. And even though they were three and a half back of Memphis, they played Memphis twice. Uh, they had three games left against San Antonio, including that night. They were going to have two left against the Kings. So they were they were in position to make a run for that AT, which is why many statistical models had them uh, making that AT and being in the playoff race. But for you know for for reasons out of their control, uh, things just kind of went haywire. So. Uh, it, it was a weird year, even going back. I mean, when you got to think about this, the Zion experience this year has just been out of this world. From from the moment he was, you know, they, they got the lottery pick about a year ago to like around this time. His first and only summer league game, he plays eight minutes, and it ends with an earthquake. <laughs> like, he, there was an earthquake in his first game. It, there was just so many things that, just have been so weird like the day before the regular season he has surgery on his knee there's so many of these games where they they front loaded the schedule on purpose with tv games because they wanted to get zion out the way early just in case he wasn't going to be there late uh, because they were going to fall out the playoff race and it's all just so weird right now man and to to be where we're all right now it's it's just kind of crazy yeah, the the best laid plans of mice and men sort of thing. And the way the, the COVID deal went, there was so much uncertainty. What was that in Sa in Sacramento? Was that a Tuesday night that week? Do you remember? Wednesday night game. That was the Wednesday? That was a – let's let's go back to, to the trusty calendar. It was a Wednesday night uh, because I, cause there was two more games left on that road trip. Uh, they were going to see to Utah on that Friday night. And then they were going to play in L.A. on that Saturday night. And I remember getting a call the day before this that basically said, hey, we're pulling you off the road. All, right. All reporters are off the road. You can cover games at home. Um, at the same time, we were prepping for games without fans. 
That's what we thought were going to happen. We thought games without fans were about to happen. Um, so we're talking about, you know, the, this new press conference protocol that was being put into the NBA. Uh, you, they were, everything had to be press conference. You weren't allowed in the locker rooms. And it just – it was just weird, dude. It was just <laughs> – Because we saw, we saw that week how smoothly a press conference can go in the COVID world. <laughs> it was – it was like Zion was like kind of – Zion was kind of joking with us. Obviously, we know what Rudy did uh, on on his side, but it was it was just a weird week, man. Like that's the best way to put it was it was just a weird couple of days and then you get home and everything is just shut down and it was it was, it was nuts. Do you feel like you've taken any – real new lessons from this process or it's more just been an amplification of the constant knowledge that you have to be flexible and, and be able to adjust on the fly. That kind of goes with journalism as a whole. I think it stresses that it stresses the, you, you got to be flexible. Sometimes you got to be, you know, especially sometimes at the lower levels, you got to, you got to do everything. You got to be ready to have your, your camera out. You got to be ready to, to video yourself. You got to be ready to, 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 to be multimedia reporter and not just be, Oh, I'm writing a story or doing this. And it, it, it certainly stressed that. And I, I think you're going to see some things come out of this as we do things a different way. Um, maybe locker room access is limited. Not that I, I like that. I don't, I don't want locker room access to be limited, but I, I do think they'll you'll see some things that'll, that'll come out different looking out of this, but you just you always have to be flexible. You always got to have your head on a swivel um, to basically just be ready for for anything. I mean, like we didn't. I mean, going into that night, we didn't think that. I, mean, I thought I was covering a game. I thought I was covering the. I did think I was covering the last game that was going to have fans for sure. Uh, we thought they were going to basically kick fans out and go from there. Um, I, I sure as heck didn't think I was covering a game that was going to get canceled, uh, or I was going to go on Scott Van Pelt and make up a word on Sports Center that night. So cancelization. I um uh, twenty twenty Andrew forward, Lopez. Um, th- that was that, that was just a nerve wracking night, dude. That was so <laughs> um. It was it was just a lot, man. It was, and it, but it just kind of shows you got to have your head on a swivel. You got to be, got to be ready for anything. And I think, you know, the, that night and and you know everything kind of surrounding that kind of just kind of proved that. Not so seamless transition. Um, you mentioned some some changes and the fact that there's probably going to be some new normals. How how different was it to watch some of the way the media access worked through those episodes of the last dance that we've been watching the last several weeks to where we are now. And how similar do you think sports reporters 10 or 15 years younger than us are going to maybe see something about what's happening now and be like, Oh, like that's when that changed. Like that's not, this is not how it's always been. Even like talking to guys like Mark Spears, even like, like 10 years ago, how different things were. Uh, in terms of access and what you were able to do. But I mean, like, I couldn't imagine driving to a game with Zion right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like a ma was able to do, or like, you know, chilling in the, in a, a hotel room in Barcelona, it's Mike magic, Larry in a ma shot sitting right there. Like, Oh, I don't know if there's that level of trust still with the media. Um, there's a lot of trust that you have to kind of build up yourself. And there's NBA players who like, oh, I, I have the, that, but like driving to and from a game with them, like just see it, like all of that, like sitting, sitting in the training room with Michael Jordan pregame. Um, it just, it's like, man, like that was, like we had it good as reporters <laughs> and now we definitely do not. That was one of the things that I knew going in was going to be something that I was struck by because anytime anything from that era or before comes up, it always stands out to me so much to see some of those differences, both from the the general interaction with the media as well as some things that I think 
more people outside of media could kind of relate to with the dynamics of social media now compared to at that point, I knew that some of the, the media relationships and the impact of social media were going to be things that really kind of caught my attention and certainly was the case because at this point, I don't think I could go to Vegas for two days without people snapping at me, let alone be Dennis Rodman and do it in the middle of a, a basketball season. So it, it really That's was so, so interesting beyond just the nostalgia of us watching that NBA that we grew up with, but now being professionals in our thirties and seeing it through that lens too was, was so interesting. I, I just imagine how different Michael's career would have been uh, if it would have happened in the social media era. I mean, you could just think about if he's in new Orleans and he wants to go to Harris until three, four in the morning, there, there'd have been nothing but snaps up of that or same thing with like a black, a Charles Barkley, you know, I mean, these guys, you know, like to, like to party and uh, oh, no telling what Snapchats of Charles Barkley are coming out at. at you know, three. <laughs> it, it is just crazy of, you know, of, I mean, Mike talked about how, how much that, that one part of that, you know, going down to Atlantic City with his dad at one in the morning and coming back, whatever, coming back at 12 or whatever it was. I mean, they said it was two or three, but I mean, that was just, people couldn't verify that. Like you could be verified. Like you, there's cameras everywhere. There's snaps everywhere. There's phones everywhere. And he talked about the pressure getting to him, the outside pressure of the world and, and not being this, you know, happy-go-lucky Gatorade, McDonald's, Nike guy. When he turned into the villain, he he didn't like turning into the villain, and um, it it just seems like with the, his style. Also, I'm not gonna say his style wouldn't work today because his, his Kobe it worked for Kobe. I mean, it works. It still works in today's, you know, with today's kids and certain certain aspects there's a little bit more difference i think some of that comes with having the um having a strong coach or doing some things different but it, it it just just the difference in 20 years of how he operated 20 30 years of how he operated um it's just really weird to me but but the biggest thing is if he took place in the social media area things would have been so so much different yeah no doubt. That's, it's, it's so interesting. The first, I think it was after the first weekend SVP had Steve Kerr on after one of the first couple weekends and, and Steve talked about the, the fame aspect and how different being famous then were, was versus what it is now. And that group may have been, better equipped to deal with that sort of thing at this point than, than maybe a lot of other groups, because you saw what, I mean, I think a lot of us have, have known something that, that stood out about Jordan for so long is that that singularity of focus that, that he had and, and the competitive drive that was just kind of otherworldly, as well as you mentioned the coaching dynamics and the ability to handle all of those, those different personalities and moving pieces that, maybe that that group could have been better equipped for, for what we're dealing with now in terms of the, the landscape of things, but it definitely would have presented a, a whole lot of different challenges, no doubt. It was, um, it was just a lot. I mean, like, like imagine, imagine Dennis Rodman in the social media era. He would have owned this era. It, it's just, there's just so much to take away from it that you would just like, man, this is just, but I, I mean, we grew up with it and it was still just so different how just technology has made people accessible from, from where we were just, you know, when, when Jordan was playing. Where in the midst of, of all of this in the nineties, do you first really vividly remember kind of being old enough and, and being aware of what was happening to a point where you look back and that's kind of the, the year of all of it that, 93 finals yeah 93 finals going against Barkley is some of the first games I remember watching the first game I ever remember like watching watching honestly was like Kentucky Duke uh was that that elite eight game and then I remember being obviously 
interested in sports around then and and but like the the first like vivid memories I had of like being like a fan was probably 90 93 92 93 yeah. going, going for the three p um going against the suns I remember wa- like watching it in in like my living room and uh my dad at the time was working for the picayune as a uh as a delivery guy so he was going to bed and I had to, I remember I had to, I had to watch it, but I had to be quiet. Um, like I couldn't yell. I, like I remember that. I remember, I remember vividly like being at my grandma's house for the comeback game in, in 95 when he, uh, when he, when he comes back. Um, there's just so much about it that it was just like starting to get, so like I, vividly the 93 sons and then him going play baseball and i was like wait what yeah. <laughs> um, i remember trying to see if like the barons played the zephyrs which they didn't because it was two different uh yeah. two different classifications but I, I remember looking i guess so that's that's probably when i first like really really started clearly the 94 finals i was writing about in notebooks so nba live was already a part of my life at that point yeah that's i was pretty similar time frame i i kind of well we're remember, six months apart, so we probably should be on a similar time frame yeah and, but <laughs> you i think were probably even a little bit ahead of me despite being six months younger because i my recollections of 93 were kind of a little bit more vague and then i really remember the exit for baseball and the rocket years when my <laughs> uncle was living in houston at the time and so the start of all this NBA throwback jersey madness was a Clyde Drexler jersey in the mid '90s that got sent by my uncle, and here we are. So it's uh, his fault. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I got a uh, a Theo Ratliff Portland Trailblazers on the way. So <laughs> you should you should. I need a list. I need a full list of everything you had. Yeah. Can you do that for me? Yeah, absolutely. I've got them all in one corner of the closet, alphabetical by city name. And uh, and then within the the team, it goes alphabetical by city name, not That's even alphabetical I, by what's on the jersey or alphabetical by the actual uh, human being. No, I. That's how I learned as a kid. I learned my NBA teams through a book I had growing up. That was Atlanta, Boston, Charlotte, Chicago, Cleveland, Dallas, Denver, Detroit, Golden State, Houston, Indiana, uh, LA, LA. It was still Vancouver, so Miami, Milwaukee, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, Orlando, Philly, Phoenix, Portland, Sacramento, San Antonio, Seattle, Toronto, Utah, Vancouver, Washington. And so that's how I still have them. <laughs> I, I did have to, to figure things out and move my Grizzlies to Memphis because the, the Grizzlies jerseys I have are Memphis Grizzlies jerseys. I've got a Gary Payton in there, so there's still a Seattle representation, but – um yeah i i've been trying to figure out ways to make this more entertaining and turn it turn it into a game of like what is the the last jersey i wore on a given week before i go on on ray's show on tuesdays or something because it's it's kind of goofy and i also this morning was the highlight of my rp3 and company radio career oh yes with ray because i got to open up for carrie kittles who any any non elite guard in the 90s any good but not hall of fame type guard in the 90s is is my favorite player on oh, a given day. did you ever go one sock up one sock down oh yeah for sure i my sock game was ridiculous as a youth basketball player um i i think between the socks and just writing stuff on myself and then my antoine walker shimmy my I'm mom out. wanted no out. part writing on yourself oh yeah i i had sharpie tattoos as a, as a child playing basketball so it was it was always entertaining whether i, I need i need to go get pictures of this. i need pictures of these it was entertaining whether i was going to embarrass my mom more or she was going to embarrass me because i was also loud i as much as we get frustrated if if like high school basketball players don't communicate on defense I was talking all the time, whether it was relevant or not. I was nonstop. <laughs> I need I need pictures of youth basketball, Jared. I'm sh- yeah, and I, I've got. I don't know if I have found in this 
tidy up, process any photos that old because I mostly still have my stuff from high school that I've kind of moved around with, but I'm sure there's some photos floating around somewhere at, at some family member's house of, of me in layers of socks. Once, once Jason Terry got into the league and I found out he was wearing several pairs of socks at a time at Arizona, um, I was definitely wearing multiple pairs of, of knee high socks. A lot of times just kind of mixing it up. Never a dull moment. I got, I got nothing now, dude. I got nothing. I, did, did you have any, any big superstitions or uh, fashion tidbits? Like, did you wear a, a headband at all? Like sweatband, any sort of. No, the only, socks? Thing I was, only thing I remember doing is going one sock up, one sock down, like carry. That was yeah. the only thing. Cause I knew like my dad's one of my dad's good friends, like was, was close to Kerry. I remember when <laughs> Kerry Kittle was in high school and when he got to the nets, Kerry bought a motorcycle. Um, and this was early in his career and the nets basically told him, Hey man, no, you can't do that. Uh, get rid of it. And Kerry's way of getting rid of his motorcycle was, um, in New Orleans is where he had it at. And he, while my dad's friend was at work, he went and just put it in his living room. Um, and just parked his motorcycle in this guy's living room. Like, Hey, I can't have this here. You take it. Um, and just, <laughs> just left it there. That's so, fantastic. um, I had a, I had a Kerry Kittles and Keith Van Horn signed hat in my room for a while. Um, I guess then that's what one of the teams I guess I cheered for growing up. So before, I guess my early part of the, like after the Bulls, um, I was like a Bulls and Magic guy early on, like shocker. Um, and then I kind of moved to the Nets when they were making their run um, mm. early with Kerry and then kind of into their, uh, their, you know, their run to the finals those years. So that was really the only thing I remember really doing was going like one sock up, one sock down. Everything else after that, it was – is whatever what is i'm gonna ask you for the official espn stance of would the bulls have won a seventh in the the lockout shortened 99 season i don't i don't know um ramona had a really good story on this about how it would have come together uh, yeah. i think a lot of it depends on what scotty would have done uh would they have paid scotty would, would Scotty have taken a one-year deal to, to make a push for one more? Um, Phil kind of nixed it early on because Phil basically said like a week after he wasn't coming back. Um, Tim Floyd, when he, I, he went on with, with Jordy and T-Bob, he was like, I was under the impression I was going to coach these guys. And then it was, it was throughout that process where they decided he was, he was gone. Um, Jordan retired in that January, right before the season started. Um, so there's a lot of uh, ifs and like the nostalgic part of you wants to believe that, yeah, the goat it would it would have won another one, but it was it would have been it would have been hard at that year. I mean, they they would have had an advantage if, if I'll I'll say this if the if the lockout still happens. And you had a shorter training camp and a shorter time to get together. I, I do think they would have had an advantage right, um, over other teams of, of having that cohesiveness already built up, especially if Scotty would have come back. But that would have been – man, that would have been fun if they had got through the East and had a, a we would have had a, a Bull Spurs final. That would have been – that would have been something. Like, what does that do to Tim Duncan's legacy if he – if, like, the Spurs still win that? Yeah. He's a, he's a second-year guy at this point, but. Yeah. It would have – it would have certainly been a, a different dynamic watching the the tail end of the Bulls versus the beginning of the Spurs than, uh, than those Spurs beating up on Latrell Sprewell, Sprewell and the, the Knicks. And then, and then the Lakers come in and screw it all up anyway, so. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that now that would have been one if they if they'd have got there a year early. 
But if they stay, where does Phil go? Does Phil ever go there? Does Phil ever untap that potential? I mean, there's so many what ifs that get opened up if they go back for a seven. Which is one of your favorite games. I love what if games. Man, I love what ifs. Well, man, I certainly appreciate uh, catching up with you a little bit and talking about some of this stuff. Um, obviously, we've been living through all that in the group text every Sunday night. <laughs> uh, but good to chop it up a little bit more. Have to do it again sometime. All right, man, just uh, go good, get a haircut, dude, please. I know. I I have to get down there. Actually, my barber got into a motorcycle accident a couple weeks ago and is he's trying to – Perry's guy's house. Yeah, he's he's been trying to shake back, and I, he's just getting back to kind of communicating with people and stuff like that, but he's going to be out of that level of commission for a while. So I'm going to have to go see uh, one of our other friends and get a, a little trim – in the meantime, and then just gear up for what was supposed to be a birthday perm will now I think be a, a September like pre Halloween perm situation. I might, I might just go for it, bleach it, do a John Michael Wozniak uh, Halloween situation, pay homage to, to the, the other goat and get myself up to Chicago for a weekend. Good luck, buddy. Appreciate you, man. <laughs> Later. <laughs>